and welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe. I'm Doug Keck at the intersection of faith and reason here from Irondale, Alabama, the home of EWTN, our major studios right here. This is the mothership. And of course, each week you get to email us questions at spitzersuniverse at EWTN.com. Post your questions on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash EWTN online, hashtag FSUniverse, and send us a tweet at twitter.com forward slash EW10 hashtag FS Universe. That's FS for Father Spitzer Universe. And of course, the Magis Center, check out their website, Magis Center, one word, dot com. And uh, before we get started, just wanted to mention one more time about a wonderful new uh, edition of Mother Angelica's book, Answers Not Promises. Uh, she's got answers uh, that uh, kind of contravene some of the promises you get from the world today. It's the kind of thing that I think uh, viewers of EW10 and lovers of Mother Angelica, if they haven't read this book, should pick it up. And it's got a all new forward by Father Joseph Mary Wolf, our wonderful chaplain here at EW10. Again, check out Mother Angelica's Answers Not Promises at EW10RC.com. Okay, very good. EW10's Religious Catalog. And with that commercial taken care of, now we move once again to the world of Father Spitzer and the universe that exists on the West Coast at our studios out there. Welcome, Father. I missed you. I mean, uh, it's, been, it's been two weeks since we actually actually got to talk to each other. How are you doing? That's right. I missed you too, Doug. Oh, no, I'm doing just great. And uh, But uh, back in the old seat here, which I really love. So uh, right. good to hear from you. It's great. And uh, hopefully at the end of, uh, I think it's the end of uh, August, I'm going to be actually out in California. We're going to be doing a special uh, program with uh, Bishop Barron uh, from the Christ Cathedral oh, uh, the facility out there. Uh, on, uh, oh, wonderful. So uh, we'll do that, and at the same time, we'll be able to do our show live, hopefully to, uh, together in the same room, unless you're going to fly here while I'm there. Maybe you might arrange that so no. <laughs> you'll be here and I'll be there. But, but hopefully the two of us will be together and we'll see, uh, see how that works out. And, of course, this is part two of evidence okay. of God's existence is their physical evidence of Jesus is resurrection. And so uh, let's go to our first question. Right. Somebody had a very interesting question. This is kind of part two. Good afternoon, Father Spitzer. Mm -hmm. Didn't the Apostle Paul, in his accounts, talk about the many witnesses that saw the resurrected Christ? Something around 500, God bless. So we, we hear something about that, obviously, the people who saw our Lord. So do you view that mm -hmm. as proof? Is that historical proof or is that just, again, a matter of faith? Yeah, in, um, first, in the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, right at the beginning there, Paul lists the witnesses to the resurrection. Now, of course, he didn't list the women in that list because at that time, uh, women could not be official witnesses like in a, in a court or in a religious court. So he, he leaves them off, although he would include them, obviously, as witnesses, but they're not legal witnesses. And the reason Paul only only re, uh, restricts himself to legal witnesses is because he's making a very important argument in 1 Corinthians 15. But but here is the list. He says first he appeared to Peter, Cephas, right? That's Peter. Then he appeared to the twelve, and we have accounts of that, of course, uh, in uh, the the gospel accounts. Then he appeared to 500 of the brethren all at once, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Now that comment is an addition from Paul, right? He's, Paul knows the list of witnesses, but he adds this comment because what he's trying to say is, look, you can go out and, and, and research this for yourself. Find these witnesses. There's 500 of them out there. They were all present at the same event and ask, you know, did you see the glorified Christ in the way that St. Paul, or we wouldn't be to say that, mm -hmm. in the way that Paul has described it. And of course, at that juncture, the verification would have been evident because Paul's writing this list within living memory of Jesus. Then he goes on in the list. Next, he appeared to James, and James is the head of the Jerusalem church. So uh, Jesus' special appearance to James is, uh, as it were, a mandate to become head of the Jerusalem church. Peter's going to be head of the universal church, and he is going to leave Jerusalem eventually to go on mission and, and 
then go ultimately to Rome. So James is appointed the head of the Jerusalem church. Then he appeared to all of uh, the brethren, right? And, and what that means is all the brethren. These are the brethren who are, are going to go out and be the original missionaries. Seemingly, these are people in Jerusalem where Jesus appears over a series of days uh, to various groups of people who are going to become the foundation of the missionary church out of Jerusalem. And then Paul adds, and then he appeared to me as one born out of due course. In other words, I didn't live with him. I didn't see him during his ministry, but I was born out of due course. But he gave me a special call. And when he gave it to me, he also appeared as the glorified, spiritually glorified, risen Jesus. Now, why does Paul first give this list and only legal witnesses in this list? Because he's going to formulate an argument argument, a legal argument about the validity of the testimony of these witnesses. And he does it by way of a dilemma. And if I might just uh, just mm -hmm. go into the dilemma a little bit and you'll see, this is a very ingenious legal argument. And Paul's acquainted with this legal terminology and methodology. So what he says is, in brief, he says, look, if Jesus is not risen from the dead, i.e., if we're lying about having seen Jesus risen from the dead, and we still believe in God, we still believe in the God of our ancestors, of, of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, right? We still believe in the God of our ancestors, and we're lying about Jesus' resurrection, meaning, of course, we're causing apostasy to the Jewish faith, to come to Christianity, and there's nothing here because Jesus is not risen from the dead, then we are perjurers before God and the worst of all men. Now, what does that mean? We ought to be condemned. Mm -hmm. We ought to lose our salvation and our souls for doing this on the basis of an empty lie. I condemn myself if I am lying before God. Then Paul switches the dilemma and he says, okay, maybe we're complete cynics. Maybe we're lying about God and we, uh, lying about the resurrection of Jesus, and we don't believe in God. We don't believe in the God of our ancestors at all. We don't believe in Judaism. We're just cynics and we just want to start a movement and we want to gain a lot of popularity from people and cause all this apostasy to the Jewish faith just for personal gain. Paul says, wait a minute, wait a minute. What personal gain? We're not getting anything out of this at all. We're getting hammered. We're losing our social status. We're losing our cultural status. We're being thrown out of the synagogue, which we don't want to be thrown out of. And we're being actively persecuted. We're being thrown out of towns and people are trying to kill us. Hey, wait a minute. If we're lying about, uh, about the resurrection of Jesus and we don't believe in God, why not just eat, drink, and be merry? Mm -hmm. For tomorrow we are going to die by our own profession we don't believe in anything after this life. We're going to die. Why should we embark on this act of preaching the risen Christ, which has caused us to lose absolutely everything? We gain absolutely nothing out of this deal. And so, of course, why not eat, drink, and be merry? Now, if you look at that dilemma, that's a beautiful, beautiful legal piece of reasoning. Mm -hmm. Because what's a good witness? A good witness is one who has everything to lose and nothing to gain by their testimony. Mm -hmm. What's a bad witness? Everyone, anyone who has everything to gain mm -hmm. and nothing to lose by their right. testimony. And a neutral witness, of course, is neutral. So the key thing Paul's trying to say is, hey, look, I'm losing both ways. If I'm lying about the resurrection and I do believe in God, I condemn myself and everybody else condemns themselves because we're causing apostasy on the basis of a lie which is empty. And on the other hand, if I'm if I, lying about the resurrection and I don't believe in God and I'm a complete cynic and I'm doing this for personal reason, there's no personal gain in it. I'm being thrown out of every town. I've lost my social status. I've lost my religious status. I've lost my financial status. And I'm being actively persecuted. Mm -hmm. What gain? You know, what's in it for us? Nothing. We're complete losers if we're lying. But if we're telling the truth, 
then it's worth all the consequences. Because, of course, bring it on. Bring on the martyrdom mm -hmm. because Jesus is risen from the dead. And then he concludes with this remarkable statement. If Jesus is not risen from the dead, then your faith is in vain and our preaching is worthless and all those who have died in Christ have died in their sins. So here's the consequences, everybody. We know them. We know that if we're not preaching the truth, we know that we're the losers, the complete losers. We gain nothing. But if we're telling the truth, we gain the crown of glory from the risen Jesus who appeared to right. us as we said. Right. So, Father, it's interesting. While you were talking about describing what St. Paul was experiencing, I was thinking mm -hmm. how much of it sounds like it fits today that if we were to talk about yeah. the idea of standing up for the truth and the oppression that now is going on and that people are going to have to see that there's going to be more and more pressure on us. We certainly saw recently with the Supreme Court uh, rulings that, uh, you know, oh, that, yeah. that religious oh, yeah. liberty is certainly not the most positively viewed thing at, at the court. Uh, so, yeah. you know, oh, it's no. interesting that the, a lot oh, of what it's... Paul was talking about. Now, when Paul talks about when he saw the Lord, is that talking about his Damascus Road experience or did he have any other experiences that we know? Yes. Of? No, that's the, definitely the Damascus Road experience. And of course, you know, um, uh, Paul sees the Lord, but he sees him in his spiritually glorified form, which is precisely the way that the apostles see him in the gospel mm -hmm. accounts. Now, you have to remember that the gospel accounts, uh, you know, are, are written, you know, um, differently from account to account because Jesus is transformed. Mm -hmm. and, and so it, what you're talking about, here, right, is a transformation um, of, he's not just a resuscitated corpse anymore, right? Mm -hmm. He's not just kind of coming out with flesh uh, uh, and bones anymore. He's coming out and he's like, uh, he, he, he has the appearance of his former body. He has the appearance of his former body, uh, you know, that, that where the wounds are very, very clear. Mm -hmm. But also that former body seems to be transformed in light, in glory. There's something about him that's mm -hmm. just utterly appearing almost like a godlike figure. And so when, you know, we, we look at the, the, uh, the gospel of Matthew, for example, when Jesus appears, everybody bows down and worships, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in other words, it, it, worship is a word that is used very rarely in the gospel of Matthew and is reserved only for God. The devil tries to get Jesus to worship him, but Jesus says, no, you yeah. shall worship the Lord your God alone. Him alone shall you serve. And then we see that in Matthew's gospel, uh, everybody at, at this resurrection account, uh, when Jesus appears, they all bow down and worship, right? Mm -hmm. So of course, they're not doubting that they're seeing anything. And then, uh, then Matthew adds this cryptic remark, though some doubted, right? And I'll explain that in a moment, oh, because of say, course, right. they're not doubting the fact that they're experiencing God and the, a theophany and this mm -hmm. glorified, luminescent vision of power, right? They're not doubting doubting that, but you know, is that Jesus? And then mm -hmm. Jesus comes and reveals himself to them saying, full power and authority on heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go therefore Let me and ask baptize you a question, all Father. nations right. in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let me ask mm -hmm. you this question then. Thinking about that and thinking of the upper mm -hmm. road experience with Thomas. So was this glorified mm -hmm. body the body that Thomas was able to touch and put his fingers into the womb? Or was Christ in a different mm -hmm. form at that point? How was he able mm -hmm. to touch him if it wasn't his, his body? Because, or do we not understand well, that? It is his body. It, 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 here's the deal. Um, the thing is that all the gospel writers are struggling to portray what Paul classifies as a pneumati consoma, a spiritual body. Mm -hmm. So there's the, 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 certainly the continuity with his former embodiment, a real body mm -hmm. that you could put your finger into the hand of, but then there is also the 
the spiritual component of this. Now, what Luke does when he's describing it is when Jesus comes on the scene, Luke says the first reaction they have, right, is, whoa, there's a spirit here, right? Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the spirit uh, scares them. It's terrifying them. And Jesus says, you know, well, why are these doubts rising up in your hearts? See, it is me. Mm -hmm. And then he shows him again the wounds, them again, excuse me, the right. wounds of the crucifixion. And when he does, presumably, it's in a tactile way because Luke goes out of his way to try and say that it's, it, he is in a tactile form, a touchable form that could even eat a fish. Then we get to John's accounts. Now, John uh, presents a more corporeal Christ, so it seems, right? Mm -hmm. So it seems like when Jesus appears, the first thing, of course, is he goes right through the doors. Resuscitated corpses do not normally do this. Mm -hmm. They are still stopped by the laws of physics from going through doors, but not transformed mm -hmm. corporeal beings like Jesus, who is a spiritual body, who goes goes right through the locked doors and appears to them and scares them. And then, of course, you know, he identifies himself through the same wounds, except uh, not the same ones, uh, there's the wounds on his hand and his side. And, of course, he, he basically, um, you know, um, mm -hmm. we'll get back to Thomas in, in one moment, then gives them the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the main thing to, to recognize with, the, with John's accounts is prior to the resurrection, the word kurios is used of Jesus, but without the definite article. Kurios is the Greek word for Lord. But it could mean, without the definite article, it means like sir, master, etc., right? Mm -hmm. uh, you could use it as a human form of address. But with the definite article, which is a the, the Lord, that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Adonai or, or Yahweh, which is the name for God. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, in the post-resurrection narratives, John starts using the word hakurias of Jesus. Now, I mean, that's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, we know that in the confession of Thomas, after he puts his fingers inside the, the wounds in the hands, and we have to believe that Jesus has the tactile capacity to have, you know, um, you know, Thomas put, uh, you know, his fingers inside those wounds. He says, he literally says, ha kurias mu, ha the, the Lord of me, the God of me. I mean, no, you can't get any more explicit about the divine nature on the lips of the apostles. And, and of course, mm -hmm. It's only the narrator who tells us Jesus has appeared. Because as we can see in both John 20, which is the, the, the closed door accounts, and also the Sea of Tiberias accounts, John 21, we see very, very clearly that when the apostles see Jesus, they are seeing ha kurios. They're seeing the Lord. They're seeing the divinely transformed one. Even that cryptic remark on the beach where John just kind of says, you know, and no one dared to ask, who are you? Mm. Because they knew very right. well it was ha kurias. Mm. It was the Lord with the definite article, with the divine attribution there. So clearly John in his own way is indicating that Jesus ha has been divinely transformed and that it is very evident to the apostles, though his corporeality is evident and right. really present such that, uh, as you say, Thomas could put his fingers, fingers into in his hands. Yeah. And yeah, and how do how to explain it, you know, I mean, St. Paul just says, well, he's a pneumaticon soma. He's right. both. Right. He's a spiritual okay. body. <laughs> you know? So with that being the yeah. case, we're going to have our own definite article, and that is that we have to take the break in the show so we can get to some more <laughs> questions here. Speaking here once again, of course, with Father Spitzer, uh, illuminating us all about our Lord and his resurrected body. Much more ahead questions about angels and other questions for you right here on Father Spitzer's Universe. Stay with us. And 
welcome back to Father Spitzer's Universe. I'm Doug Keck here, uh, anchoring uh, from our EWTN studios, the mothership in Irondale, Alabama, talking again with Father Spitzer. Let's go to Father Spitzer right now. We're talking about the evidence for Christ's physical resurrection. And here's a question that came in, Father. Mm -hmm. uh, what did Jesus mean when he <laughs> said that when we are resurrected, we will be like the angels? In what way will we be mm -hmm. like the angels? This is from Nick and Christina, and that's an email they sent in. I think sometimes, you know, certainly when we were kids growing up, we used to kind of think in general, like, oh, when you died, you kind of became like an angel. You went up to, to the horn blows mm -hmm. at midnight, the, the famous uh, uh, film by Jack yeah. Benny that uh, used to play on New Year's Eve yeah, all the yeah. time, for those who might yeah, recall, uh, uh, with the angels, et cetera, and the fallen angels. But uh, we understand it differently as we get older, right? <laughs> What yeah. about angels? How right, is it like right. angels? What did he mean? Yeah, I mean, there, there is certainly in intertestamental uh, Judaism, you know, there is a prolific belief in, in angels, but essentially angels are spiritual, spiritual beings. And Jesus definitely believes in his ministry that people, that, 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 that the people of the resurrection are not just going to be resuscitated corpses. When we talk about N.T. Wright later on in the program, uh, you know, this is an important distinction because uh, what the what Second Temple Judaism thought, and Second Temple Judaism is a, a a set of doctrines that developed during the time of the Second Temple. So when Israel comes back from its exile and Darius allows the Jews to rebuild the Second Temple in about 550 B.C., all the way to the time of the destruction of, of the Second Temple in 70 uh, A.D., right in that period, a set of Jewish doctrines developed, which the Christian church allied itself to, but not in the resurrection. We'll talk about that. There's a very special case. But in this particular case, the Jewish people actually believed that it would be more like a corporeal resurrection. I'd be coming back in my flesh, but my flesh would basically last, you know, for a long, long time, etc. And, and of course, uh, there wasn't going to be a real transformation. Jesus insists that there is going to be an angelic, that is to say, a spirit spiritualized transformation of the body that's no longer going to be subject to physical laws. Now, that, I'm putting it in, in 21st century terminology, right? Uh, in other words, the idea of physical laws is not, you know, properly, you know, uh, framed up in the, in the first century. So the, the main thing is what, what Jesus, though, does mean is, yeah, we're not going to be subject to, this, uh, to physical laws. We're not going to be subject to gravity. We're not going to be subject to, 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 to locked doors. We're not going to be subject uh, to corruption. We're not going to be subject, you know, to pain, right? And, and, and of course, pain is a huge part of the, of, of the physical body. Well, all of these things will be completely transcendent, which were features of the angels. And, and so for uh, Jesus, then, the resurrection is much more than just, a, as it were, kind of a, a, a resuscitation of the physical body, right? It, it's going to be a trans transformation mm -hmm. of the physical body where we still have our, our corporeal features, but it will be in some kind of angelicized form, if I can put it that way, that it'll be spiritualized form. And, and this is exactly what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says, we will be just like him, mm -hmm. a pneumati consoma, a spiritual body, a glorified body, a body risen in power and spirit and glory and 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 so in a sense then like the angels mm -hmm. okay. so that's that's essentially that's how he's looking at okay, it okay mm -hmm. very good very good let's tie into another question that you answered a little bit earlier uh, father spitz i've always wondered why jesus told mary magdalene not to touch him because he had not yet risen to his father and yet days later he has Thomas place his hands in his wounds. Can you explain the discrepancy? Thank you, Valerie. Yeah, there are two sets of um, uh, there are two sets of of appearances here, right? There are the appearances to uh, the women, which actually occur 
um, you know, um, before the, the appearances to the apostles. Now, for whatever reason, and I, I must say it, it is a subject of great debate among historical exegetes, why it seems that the appearance to the women is much more corporealized, mm -hmm. right? It, that is to say, Jesus does not appear to be manifesting either the spiritual features or the glorified features that he manifests very clearly to the apostles just subsequent to it. So, uh, you know, again, there's a lot of debate why that is so. Now, you know, the first thing, of course, is, hey, Jesus is already transphysical. Mm -hmm. He can appear any way he wants. Mm -hmm. He can appear to Mary Magdalene, just looking like the gardener. He can appear to the apostles uh, walking along the road, right, you know, uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, well, to Emma Aus, right, or to Emmaus, as we sometimes pronounce it, mm -hmm. right? So he can appear, you know, hey, you guys, what are you talking about on this road here? And he can look very ordinary. Why? Mm -hmm. Because he's transphysical. If he wants to appear like a physical being, mm -hmm. he can appear like a physical being. But he can also very definitely appear looking like Jesus in his former mm -hmm. body, and certainly he can appear in a divinized, spiritualized, glorious, glorified, powerful way, which he did universally in the appearances to the apostles. So that being the case, right, uh, we don't know why, uh, first of all, uh, you know, Jesus appears to the women in a much more corporeal form. Were they used to, uh, you know, uh, uh, seeing him that way? Is, 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 did Jesus choose this because, uh, you know, uh, he wanted uh, to, to uh, have Mary identify uh, him in her heart? I have to believe he did. But, you know, the idea of mm -hmm. why don't touch me in this state? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Raymond Brown in one commentary interprets it one way. Uh, other people in other commentaries interpret it another way as being that maybe he is not in his glorified form at this point and is, and is ascending to the Father, as it were, imminently. A and, of course, there are other people who interpret it in other ways, you know, that uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, you know, Jesus is, is, uh, um, is uh, trying to prevent Mary maybe from being shocked or something mm -hmm. by some change in him. There's just, just too many theories right. and okay. there's just not enough information to make any uh, determination. Right. But I can tell you one thing for sure. The reason that he doesn't allow her, her to touch him is not because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, she is somehow less deserving than Thomas. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the, the reason has to do with his glorified state or maybe not being fully into the glorified state or something of that nature. It has to do okay. with something more metaphysical than it has to do with, you know, Mary's okay. very worthy. I mean, she's obviously a, right. a, a, a total convert and a saint. Right. Well, they just, uh, didn't they just elevate her feast day? Mm -hmm. I think the Holy Father recently did. Yeah. Uh, St. Mary Magdalene. Uh, yes, right. exactly. Exactly, just recently. Yeah. Yeah, another question, let me ask you this, thinking about that, that answer and that, the, with the, mm -hmm. that posited, you know, we know our Lord talks about, I'm ascending to my Father, so we get that general idea. Then he shows up, obviously, yeah. with uh, the apostles in the upper room, etc. And then he leaves them and goes, where, where is he going back and forth? Is it, do we know, have, have we speculated about where our Lord went? Did he go from one location to another? to see other people at the same time? Was he constantly ascending uh, and descending from the Father? Any speculation? Mm -hmm. Well, ascending to the Father in John's Gospel literally means being exalted by my Father. So that, that's what it, it, the ascension and exaltation are very closely related in, in the Gospel of John. So that's what it means. It means I'm being exalted. And exalted means, uh, you know, transformed into my a glorified divine self by my Father. So uh, essentially, you know, that may be the reason that, that Mary shouldn't be touching him now. He's being transformed or, or being exalted by the Father, uh, something of that nature. But the main thing is, where does he go? Mm -hmm. he, he goes or he does. It's not limited to going anywhere on right. this earth. Right. He can pop right <laughs> back to his father, the side of his father. He could do anything he wants. He's not limited in any 
physical way, by any physical law. He can, you know, go back to the Father. He can reappear to somebody else, or he could be re, uh, he could be appearing uh, physically to to other people. Mm -hmm. And and so there's a, obviously a, a list of people that that Jesus appears to, seemingly in Jerusalem, uh, you know, as well, where he's he's moving over the course of several days, appearing to people, and then he could appear after a goodly amount of time to St. Paul, mm -hmm. you know, uh, who's on the road after actively persecuting the church for a while. So, I mean, there's, uh, uh, there's all kinds of ways, uh, you know, but we, we really don't know where he goes. Right. We just okay. know when he appears. And, and that testimony is pretty valid and pretty consistent mm -hmm. uh, in the form of his appearance. You, you kind of have to know how to read the scriptures to see the consistency, right. but he is definitely transformed and he definitely is not mm -hmm. subject to physical laws and he's definitely causing these guys to think that he is God and they're worshiping him. They're, they're thinking they're seeing a spirit. They're calling him Hakurias, the Lord or God, etc. And so we know that there's something, and of course, Paul, you know, spiritual body, we know that he has been transformed and that he is obviously divinized and they are seeing not just the right. Jesus of old, but they are seeing the Jesus of old within the context of the divinized glorified Jesus. Jesus anew. Now let me ask you this too then. So our Lord's coming mm -hmm. and going with the apostles and then being with them and mm -hmm. then saying, I'll see you in Galilee or where was that done for them? Mm -hmm. I mean the fact that he just didn't stay with them yeah. the whole time. You think that was for their benefit? Oh, yeah. If so how? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I think uh, basically it's it's like uh, you know anything else. You know, uh, for all intents and purposes, the apostles are going to be on their own for a while, and, and of course, you know they've just seen Jesus, and of course, the minute he leaves them, it's okay. You guys, we're going to have to get together. Everything's changed now. Jesus is not dead; he's alive and he's glorified and he's divinized, and we should have known all along he was the Lord, and he is the Lord. Oh, okay. What are we going to do about this? And of course, we know that there is some kind of Pentecostal experience that's going to follow upon them where they're going to be given the Holy Spirit so that they can actually go out and perform the miracles of Jesus in Jesus' own name and that they're going to be given the wisdom to understand what has gone on and what they have witnessed. But Jesus seems to do this continuously. Even in his ministry, Jesus sort of says, okay, you guys, move out there and uh, go out on an apostolic journey here and uh, missionary journey and you you know don't take any you know uh, extra food don't take any coins in your bag you know uh, I want you to depend completely on the father now uh, you know I'm nudging you off here you know it's the, the mother bird mm -hmm. I'm pushing you out of the nest and of course Jesus has to do this I mean uh, otherwise you know uh, we know already what, what Peter's tendency is right cling you know and of mm -hmm. course Peter would just say please stay I mean he even does that at the transfigure Duration, right. he, you know, almost uh, get, goes right up to Jesus, you know, hey, Lord, <laughs> it's good for us to be here. Let us build three tents, one That's for right. you, one That's for Moses, right. one for Elijah. We don't want this to stop. This is great. And, of course, Jesus, oh, oh, Peter. And, of course, the narrator says he right. hardly knew what he was saying. Right, right. So, Unfortunately, uh, what we find <laughs> with those, uh, those kind of experiences that usually when you have these pinnacle experiences, just like with St. Peter, it's because you're being prepared to go to the next level and to, and to take on something. Exactly. Uh, we don't get to live in the, in, in the tent. We're being, uh, in a sense, uh, pruned and prepared for what's ahead. Uh, just before we go to a break, right. here's, a, here's another question that just came yeah. in. Father, is it okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, as for a Catholic in our faith to be an organ donor at the time of death. So this conflict with what we believe about our resurrection. That's from Sharon. Also, it kind of fits into the whole idea of cremation too, because it used to be the church kind of frowned on cremation and now it seems more acceptable. Mm -hmm. So how does that relate? How do we see that giving our organs away, et cetera? Mm -hmm. In relation yeah, to the resurrection. It's perfectly okay. Oh, yeah. 
No, it's perfectly okay to be an organ donor, uh, Sharon, and and for all intents and purposes, um, you know, uh, the the glorification of the body, you know, um, it used to be thought, and and you know, for obviously good reasons by the church that the glorification of the body actually took uh, the complete physical body, you know, and and kind of transformed it. But now, you know, I think the the, the current view is that you know your physical body does not have to be uh, in, intact in order for Jesus to give you uh, a, a new glorified body. So yes, organ donation is perfectly fine. And uh, yes, the church does also allow for cremation and, and uh, still the glorification, uh, God is going to bring mm -hmm. that, that spiritual body, that pneumatic on soma, that, that glorified body uh, out of your uh, physical uh, remains, but also he can you know, bring it about because you know, from, you know, your, your physical status, uh, you know, before you were essentially a corpse, if I might be so blunt. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, that physical state uh, still can be transformed, uh, even if um, uh, you got in a terrible automobile wreck and, and there's not much left, right, you can still be transformed uh, into the glorified state from the status you had prior to becoming a, a corpse. Okay, very good. Now, now, another question that's, that's popped up uh, it has been the idea of talking about different terms like there's resurrection, resuscitation, and then and we read in Scripture, and certainly with our Lord as well, but in the Old Testament, uh, people who are raised from the dead. How are yeah. each one mm -hmm. of those to be seen differently? Yeah, uh, from the vantage point of um, raise, well, let's just go to resuscitation. A resuscitation would be kind of the lowest form there. And a resuscitation actually means somebody, uh, you know, who was not completely dead, right? As they say, you know, he was almost dead, mm -hmm. but not completely dead. And of course, the resuscitation occurs through some physical means, right? So somebody maybe breathes into the person, somebody does something by some kind of physical causation and causes the person to come back again, right? But they, it was a physical cause that led a person who was dormant in a coma state to, uh, to come back to normal physical life. A raising of the dead would be like that little girl uh, who might have, or Lazarus, who might have been mm -hmm. dead for several days, right? And, uh, uh, you know, or the, the, the widow of Nain's mm -hmm. uh, son, right, who had been dead for some time, was already prepared for burial. Clearly, mm -hmm. right, uh, this person is not in a state of coma at this juncture, right? Right? And, and of course, at that juncture, um, uh, what you're dealing with is a transphysical cause. You have to have a transphysical cause because if the person is dead, then it's going to require a transphysical cause to restore them to life. And that's called a raising of the dead. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus does, for example, with respect to the widow of Nain, uh, also with um, the, um, the uh, daughter of the synagogue official and right also uh, with Lazarus and John's Gospel. Now you have what's called resurrection. That's the third and, and highest level. And, and resurrection really in the Christian sense, right, completely diverges from Second Temple Judaism. And what it holds is that, uh, the res uh, that you are now going to be transformed. You are now going to become a physical hyphen transphysical. That means metaphysical being a spiritual being in a single thing. So your, your physicality is going to be transformed in some kind of spiritual, divine, uh, and, and glorified way uh, to become very much like Jesus' transformation after his resurrection. So that's a transphysical cause to a transphysical being. So the first one, a resuscitation, is a physical cause back to a physical being. A raising from the dead is a transphysical cause to a physical being. And then a resurrection is a transphysical cause leading to a transphysical being. So that's the uh, best way of uh, describing it. Very good. We're going to have our own transition right now, as they say, as we take another break here. <laughs> and on the way out, Father Spitzer, we want to encourage everybody to check out your latest book, God So Loved 
the world, clues to our transcendent destiny from the revelation of Jesus, our Lord, by the one and only Father Spitzer, our host and guest here on the program, Ignatius Press Publishing, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com. If you love this show, you love this book, God So Loved the World. Stay with us more ahead here as we continue to explore Father Spitzer's universe. Stay with us. Thank you so much for staying right here with myself, Doug Keck, your host with Father Spitzer's out in California at our Christ Cathedral Studios. Just wanted to mention one more time, check out Mother Angelica's Answers Not Promises, wonderful book now available, the latest and new edition with a forward by Father Joseph Mary Wolf, our chaplain here at EW10 at the network, and wonderful insights from the one and only Mother Angelica. And these are answers and not promises, meaning they're actually answer the questions you have in your life. They're not uh, based on a bunch of phony promises that the world gives us. And unfortunately, too many of us figure that out after we've uh, stubbed our toes one too many times. Speaking of that, we're going to switch back to uh, Father Spitzer. Let me ask you a question. A question. I was I was looking up sure. some of the information when we talk about resurrection and the difference, as you were explaining there, between resuscitation and resurrection. There's also, uh, you know, think about our Lord being resurrected, but there's also discussion about many saints being resurrected, meaning in Matthew 27, according to the King James yep. Version, mm -hmm. anyway, and the graves were open, and the many mm -hmm. bodies of saints which slept the rows and came out of the graves after mm -hmm. his resurrection went into the Holy City and appeared unto many. So were they resurrected or what happened to them? Mm -hmm. How would that be defined? Yeah, at the moment of, uh, yeah, at, at the moment of Jesus' um, resurrection, Matthew testifies to, the, to this uh, fact of the saints coming out of their graves. And, and, of course, this would be a raising from the dead. And it's an indication, not a resurrection in the, in the sense of Jesus. Jesus is the first to have the resurrection in a transphysical state, as I was describing it uh, just before the break. So the, the key thing that... Uh, one recognizes uh, for uh, the Christians the, the the raising of the saints, you know, and their appearance uh, to people, uh, you know, from the graves would be some kind of a raising from uh, of the dead, and it is a marker that the end times have begun. The whole New Jerusalem has begun, and this would have been one of the signs uh, that is to come that death has been definitively overcome by Jesus. No, but Jesus is the first mm. uh, to have, as it were a resurrection to be turned into a transphysical being. So what would have happened to those saints? I mean, uh, they came out of the graves, did they? Uh, well, you know, the, apparently they, they, they didn't, uh, they appeared to some people, and then of course we have to believe that they are ultimately taken uh, into heaven. Because heaven's and now open. And when they're taken into right. heaven, yeah. Now, heaven is now opened. Gotcha. Uh, okay. We have to believe that they became transformed as Jesus did, as St. Stephen did, as, as uh, uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary gotcha. did, and, and so forth. Okay, very good. Uh, next up, Jesus arose from the dead according to Scripture. Why is it that yeah. Jesus did not appear during something like the Holocaust? Why not at times when it seems like humanity so desperately needs him? God bless Ronnie. Now, the question is, uh, maybe he did appear yeah. during those periods. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, undoubtedly Jesus appears, right? And he appears in a variety of different ways, but he, he's not going to appear in his uh, transphysical state because as Jesus himself says and promises, when the Son of Man, that is to say, when he comes back to the earth after his resurrection, that's going to be the definitive end time. So when Jesus comes back in his transphysical state after the resurrection, this is the end time. And of course, the Holocaust, it should have maybe, it could have felt like the end time, but it wasn't right. obviously the end time. So how does then uh, Jesus appear? Well, first of all, of course, Jesus manifests himself completely through his Holy Spirit. He appears, as it were, through the 
saints who are present. And there's an enormous number of saints associated with the Holocaust who are still being canonized uh, to this day, right? And there are all kinds of, of heroic deeds that are taking place. But of course, Jesus doesn't appear in the sense of a, of a transphysical mm -hmm. being. As I said, that is reserved for the parousia alone. However, uh, the spirit is very, very active during the Second World War. And I don't want to get into my theories mm -hmm. about this. This okay. isn't church doctrine or anything like that. But I mean, you is have to admit that in your next book or what? That, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, uh, my true, uh, I mean, Omaha Beach, are you kidding me? Yeah. If that wasn't divine intervention, right, I right. mean, uh, the Battle of Midway, mm. I mean, if that was Well, that wasn't definitely divine was divine intervention. intervention. That I mean, was, right, without a doubt. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. Yes. I mean, there, there's so many things where you just right. got to look and go, did we deserve to win this war? No, no. Yeah, because God, God uh, uh, sort of helped us along, but boy, did we have an edge. And it, and it didn't hurt, mm. you know, that, that, you know, Rommel just happened to, to, to go home, right. you know, right when the, the, the Normandy invasion was going to, to take place, right. and that all the tanks were being held back, you know, the reserve. Waiting for Calais, were being held right, back. right, for Calais. Right, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Right. That's right. I mean, I'm just looking at all this going, you know, this is too much much, you know, I, I, I just have a great deal of difficulty, you know, believing, and not one aircraft carrier is bombed at Pearl Harbor, only the battleships. Are you kidding me? Right. I mean, it was going to be a war waged by aircraft carriers. So, uh, sorry I got into that, but That's right. I got to right. tell you, God was absolutely active during that Second World War, and there are a million stories, my father included, who, who you know, brought back stories like, I don't deserve to be here, I'm happy to be here. Here, you know, but right. God was looking out after me. And then there's a great sweeping historical events where these coincidences that favored us through, yes, good human courage, but there was grace right. working through human courage and human virtue right. and, the, and the desire to, to, to change the course of world history away from darkness and right. evil. Well, and growing so, up in uh, uh, growing Hitler actually was his own worst right. enemy. Well, growing up in Hawaii, I'm assuming yeah. you had an affinity for like Pearl Harbor and things like that, so. Oh yeah, my, my right. grandfather was chief naval architect of the Pacific with headquarters at Pearl Harbor, so he was very much instrumental in the mm -hmm. de design of Pearl Harbor before and after the, the bombing. So yeah, the stories were prolific. Right, 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 <laughs> okay, that's great. Well, let me ask you another question yeah. that just came in. This one, we're gonna go back now to a uh, little bit about the Shroud of Turin. Blessings, Father Spitzer. Can you discuss mm -hmm. the finding on the Shroud website that discusses the possibility of a plate on the throat of the image on the Shroud containing three Aramaic letters as an acronym for the Good Shepherd? Thank you for your ministry sacrifices, and this is from Sherry. Gee, Sherry, I, I have to admit ignorance on this question. I, I just haven't seen it, and it hasn't been part of, there, there are four main batteries of extensive tests, and, and that was not a part of them. So I'm afraid to say, um, I, I, uh, I just don't know anything about that. But, uh, you, know, um, you know, I'll go and Google okay. it now and uh, try and catch up as There you go. Were. And we'll have to see, do we have to give away, uh, will you stump Father Spitzer, do we have to give a prize away. I mean, we had, we yeah. haven't had this yeah. yet. This is like stump the yeah, band on the book. old Tonight Show. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we'll have to see. <sighs> so we're talking about the shroud. We're talking. But let me ask you another question that came up. Uh, I read something somewhere. Mm -hmm. They talked about the idea was, is it possible that Paul was actually raised from the dead? Is that your interpretation of what happened to him? Or is that an over-interpretation of what happened to Paul? No, that's an over-interpretation. I, uh, I think St. Paul basically, uh, uh, you know, Jesus uh, gave him, a, uh, as they say, a good knock um, and uh, a good uh, blinding and a good uh, appearance of himself. And uh, uh, it really got Paul's attention because he looks up and he goes, who are you, sir? Mm -hmm. And so Jesus got his, I am Jesus, and you are persecuting me. Mm -hmm. So no, I don't think Paul was in any sense uh, dead or, or anything like that. Jesus just gave him a good uh, uh, knock so that, uh, as my novice master told me, you're the type who sh who's like St. Paul. Y you need a good two-by-four mm -hmm. across the side of the head, right. but then the spiritual reality will come through. Mm -hmm. And of course, it did. And Paul, you know, once he's convinced, 
you know, it's like he becomes uh, from arch persecutor, he becomes arch friend and, and of course the apostle to the Gentiles. But no, he, he was not deceased. Coming up next, we have another question. We got to slide this one in quick. Another one about the mm -hmm. uh, shroud. This one says, good mm -hmm. afternoon, Father Spitzer. Mm -hmm. Is there a relationship between the dehydrating light on the shroud of Turin mm -hmm. and the light at the Lord's transfiguration? Boy, you know, um, I, I've always viewed it as such. I, I know that John L. McKenzie, uh, without having known any of the evidence of the shroud, uh, said that he, he felt that the light of the transfiguration uh, was akin uh, to the light that, uh, you know, the risen Jesus manifested when he appeared to his apostles. I have to, uh, to think that the same light, this incredibly bright light, um, you know, which is it's short-lived, right? It doesn't scorch the, uh, the the cloth, and that's why people think it's like vacuum ultraviolet radiation, one forty billionth of a second. But it's at an intensity at, at a magnitude of several billion watts. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that that incredibly bright light uh, is akin to something uh, not only with the transfiguration, but also his appearance to his apostles after the resurrection, and that's why they're bowing down and worshiping. That's why they're, uh, you know, thinking he's God. That's why uh, they're thinking he's a spirit and, 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 and so forth. So, yes, I think there is a parallelism without a doubt. Okay, very good. Uh, let me ask you another question about uh, the idea of the resurrection. Here, why wouldn't our Lord decide, let's say, since he obviously appeared to various people and even some of the saints who have risen up, why didn't they appear to someone like a Caiaphas uh, to show the truth of our Lord's resurrection. Why do you think that is? Because it would have been a waste of time, and the clue is given when Jesus, uh, you know, the, the, he's telling that parable of Lazarus and Dives, and finally, of course, you know, the rich man Dives is, uh, you know, in, in the netherworld, and he says, "Okay, just go back to my brothers and tell them, you know, uh, and show them, you know, that 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 uh, you know, have Lazarus show them that he is alive, then they will believe." And Jesus. Uh, and, and of course, uh, excuse me, uh, um, uh, Abraham, you know, says, you know, um, uh, uh, well, no, no, if they if they don't, you know, believe, mm -hmm. you know, on on the on the basis of, of the word of their forefathers, th then they're not going to believe even if someone should be raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, you know, Jesus right. thinks, you know, it's like casting pearls before swine. Right. Remember that the main thing about the testimony of the resurrection, and I, I know next week we'll be talking about Jesus' miracle, exactly, miracles right. and modern day right. miracles, but it's the same thing. There has to be a movement of the heart. There has to be a desire to want to follow Jesus and be saved by Jesus, right? So in other words, you got to know right. somehow, right, that you're in darkness mm -hmm. and you need to be pulled out of it and, and to make some sacrifice. I, you know, okay, I, I, I right. know I got to change my ways and I got to start working on this and I got to start saying, okay, Lord, I want to put you before these right. other dark desires, right? right? And, and so I got to start getting on the road here. But there are some people who, who may, and, and again, I don't want to, you know, make Right. any judgments about anybody. I just want to say some people could thoroughgoingly right. say, I don't want to do that. I like living in the darkness and I don't want to be saved from the darkness. And by the way, right. it's not only that. I mean, I don't like the love deal. You know, I mean, for all intents and purposes, well, Father, I have I to tell you, we have to wrap up this week. Because, we have to wrap everything oh, up okay. here because we're up against <laughs> Father Time, uh, you know, that our Lord created for us. So uh, we're going to have to take our time and our leave of everybody until the next time we can once again explore Father Spitzer's universe. Go to the Magist Center, get all that information. Wonderful materials are there. Wonderful books at EW10RC.com. Next week, we've got the miracles of Jesus then and now. I'm Doug Keck. Join us next time next Wednesday here on EWTN once more as we explore Father Spitzer's universe. Thank you.